So welcome everybody to our eighth episode of CPA to CFO. Uh, my name is Mike Whitmire. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Flowcast. Uh, for some context around the podcast, my background's in accounting. I'm a CPA. And when I was in accounting, I always thought I wanted to be a CFO. Uh, I ultimately founded my own software company. So now I'm CEO. And in meeting all these great uh, CFOs along the way, I realized that I actually had no idea what a great CFO does when I was an accountant. Uh, so with that, I wanted to interview some great CFOs out there and get their feedback on what they actually do and then really understand the career path to help everyone listening here develop their career and, and get to that CFO role if they'd like. Um, so I'm really excited today. We have on the phone Darian and Hong. Uh, Darian and I have a, a bit of a relationship here going back to this, the founding of Flowcast. Um, but welcome aboard, Darian. And I don't want to, uh, you know, we don't want to waste the audience's time. I know you're a busy guy. I don't want to waste your time either. So let's hop right into business and would love to just start walking through your career. Let's, let's take it all the way back to the beginning. Yeah, great. Um, so, you know, I, my, my career is not the traditional CFO route, which you all hear here uh, during this podcast. And um, you know, I'm, you're, you're going to hate this, what I'm going to say, which is I became a CFO by mistake. Uh, although I've been a serial CFO now, this is my third CFO role, but, um, you know, it, it's been a meandering uh, sort of figuring myself out. And you'll hear that a lot through, through what I've done. Uh, right. I'm going to start as early as college. So you just get, kind of get a sense of, of my, my mind and, and how it works. Number one, I'm probably, you know, I, I probably have uh, attention kind of uh, issues. You know, I love to multitask. I like to do a lot of things at once. I literally have three screens going and that's how I like to work. Maybe even four screens if you use the smartphone, which I do sometimes look that at counts. doing work. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm sort of into that. Um, but uh, so I started, you know, um, so I went to University of California, Irvine. So, and I went to Gunn High School in Palo Alto. And I was, after I graduated, you know, I wanted to save the world, literally. Uh, you know, I was going to, you know, I grew up uh, in a tough neighborhood of San Francisco, uh, somewhat low income. So I was always about like, how do I help for the social good? And so I started uh, at UCI uh, with this in, as a sociology major. Okay. And I'm going to save the world. So, you know, I did that for a couple of years and, and I just thought, look, I need to make a living when I grow up. And I also thought, you know, I'm not learning anything like a hard uh, technical sort of kind of academic uh, line here. And I can still influence, you know, the world if I gain power myself in, in this sort of society. Um, so I actually changed my major uh, after sophomore year. Um, I was doing a business management minor and I had to take college level economics. And it somewhat came easy to me, uh, especially mm -hmm. macroeconomics. Like, that part, it, it just, there'd be my friend sitting right next to me. I might have not studied at all, and I totally understood the concept, and he studied for hours and could still not understand the concept. And I thought, that's the path I'm, I'm going to switch my degree. So yeah. I just to make a comment there, uh -huh. like economics is one of those things where if you could, you could pick your head up and think about the, the macro to that point, right? It kind of, mm -hmm. it all falls into place. It's not as much about memorizing stuff and regurgitating it. You have to that's right. really know it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and I will suggest, you know, throughout the podcast, yeah, I'll, I'll make little suggestions, but I always suggest, you know, people that I mentor that do something that comes easy to you that you're passionate about as well. Yeah. Don't make it hard on yourself and just say, I must be a certain kind of person. Like I, you know, if being, if finances just doesn't come easily to you, don't keep pushing yourself and saying, I want to be a finance leader. Yeah. Just, just don't do that. Pick a different career path. Um, That's awesome advice. Do something that you have that kind of naturally comes to you. And everyone has different natural tendencies. You know, for instance, like art, I wanted to be an artist in high school and I kept trying to take art classes. I just didn't have the knack. You know, where my wife's an artist and she did have the knack and that's what she did. So do something, you'll be more passionate about what you do too, if you're better at it and yeah. beat the competition easy, more easily. <laughs> as well. I, I'd love to be the point guard for the Lakers, but I don't think I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to pull that off no matter how hard I work. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, um, so anyhow, I changed my uh, degree uh, major to economics and, um, you know, so I was going along there. I was also a college radio DJ. Nice. Underground right. hip -hop radio show for four years. I was a DJ with the turntables and I also there we did go. a show and uh, was the urban music director for the last two years in college as well. So that gave me a chance to like lead people in a way, you know, I had to lead a team that none of us got paid by the way. So, <laughs> so it's like, how do you motivate someone to do something for you? You know, when you're not even paying them. 
Uh, and I so what? So what'd you do? Them. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, a lot of it is, of course, you know, a little bit the golden rule: do as others as you want to be done to yourself, and kind of putting yourself in their shoes and thinking about what motivates that person. And if I can get to what motivates them, what's in it for them, you know, the with them, what's in it for me, what's in it for them, then I can get to a good place where I can um, give them projects or tasks that are attuned to what uh, they want to get out of something. And uh, that makes someone do a much better job, be more proactive. And I have to, I don't even have to stay on them. They literally would just own it because it's something they want to do. So really, I'm even in my current role, I'm always thinking about, you know, sort of um, what's in it for them and, and kind of, you know, what, what will hit them in the way that, that, you know, that they're good at, that they, they, they want to go do. So I'm always thinking about that. Um, so anyhow, I, I, uh, uh, changed my degree in economics, you know, again, I'm this hip hop DJ. Um, so then I had to, you know, it's time for graduation. I did graduate in four years, even though I switched my major and did that minor. It was nice summer and did all that. Um, so as I was graduating, I had to grow my hair out. Uh, I had to get buy some, you know, a suit and I had to do this. I started interviewing and, and the first career path I wanted to go uh, out of all places was sales. Hmm. Um, the reason why I wanted to go into sales was number one, I heard it paid well. <laughs> so it it was, does. Yeah. Um, number two, uh, I wanted to get better business acumen. And I thought at the age of 22, what role will give, will like speed, speed that up. I don't want to be caught in a, in a very minor role. I want to be sort of, you know, with business leaders and, and, and talking business. And at 22, I wasn't very good at it, you know? I, yeah. I didn't know. So I joined, um, also I wanted to learn better, um, uh, communication and presentation skills. You know, I remember while I look like I'm a super confident person, I would tell you, you know, high school, college, I, it, it was very hard for me to do a presentation in front of a group of people. I was not good at it. I hated it. It made, it just freaked me out. And so I forced myself to be put in a position and that's why radio was easy to me. You know, I, yeah. behind the curtain, you know, right. so I'm super confident behind the curtain, but in front of people face to face in, in a technical, I sold a technical product, electromechanical switches and commercial circuit breakers. Um, okay. And, 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 and talking business speak that, that I wasn't, you know, very adept at yet. Um, was, was a little scary, but I wanted to be forced into that um, situation so that I could uh, overcome that fear. So that's one of my points I tell um, a lot of the people I mentor too, is the things that you're scared of doing, you should actually go do that. And the thing that you're pushing off at work, you know, like you got a bunch of work tasks and you're like, oh gosh, you keep pushing it off. That's the one you should probably go do first. That's yeah. the stuff you're good at. You can do that on Saturday night. You can almost do it in your sleep. The stuff that you hate doing or it's really hard, you need mad focus. You need to really, you know, put your energy into it. So um, um, you should probably go do that. The stuff you're running away for is literally the stuff you should go do. <laughs> this is, yeah, that's, that makes a ton of sense. Like, and uh, small world story. So I, I used to hate presenting in front of people as well. Like my co-founder and I went to college together and he'll tell you our public speaking class, it was like embarrassing. I, I just could not do it. And now, and now like See, I had to do that. Yeah, I had to do it in Founding Flowcast. So now I speak in front of like hundreds of people and do investor pitches all the time. And yep. I, I did Toastmasters. I don't know if you mm, yeah. ever do anything like that. Yeah, I tried you, that once. Uh-huh. In college, I did. Uh, I did. Yeah. And, yep. and I mean, I found my experience was, was basically just I went and I realized I wasn't as bad as I thought I was. Right. So it was, it was more of a confidence thing. And I guess my advice for everyone on the line is like, you should have a lot of confidence if you're speaking to a subject you know. You yep. should have the confidence in your ability to say that in front of people. But you threw yourself in the deep end. You were speaking in front of people about a product that was very complicated and speaking to very high level business people, it sounds like. So what, so what kind of stuff did you learn in that role? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it definitely made me sweat. Uh, my first sales meeting, while I had great training, you know, I, I joined, I had been part of large public companies my whole career until I finally left my last, you know, uh, big company, which was AT&T and went off to a low growth company startup like Flowcast. And um, so prior to that, so I had a lot of great, I, I got a lot of good training, but my first sales meeting was the scariest thing ever. I think I'm not even much of a sweater. And I walked out of that meeting, I touched myself. I had sweat all up and down my whole, I mean, it, I've never sweat that much. It was great. <laughs> and um, I think you just and, left the gym. Yeah. And I think, you know, the thing I learned the most, uh, I mean, I've always tried to put myself in scary situations, but 
um, I, maybe I like that adrenaline rush or something. I, I, I don't know what it is, but what I found in that uh, on the career side of things, at least in that sales role, um, was that throwing myself into the deep end and putting myself in that fear situation, it because I did have confidence in my abilities. I did have that. And so I've learned that it'll all be fine and I'll figure it out. And I'm probably going to screw up. I might not, I might look really dumb in front of people at times, but you know what? It'll pass. It'll pass. And um, so I look back then and how I feel now, it's, it's just really interesting. Obviously I'm older, but um, you know, I, I look back at the, the world, I go, I don't know what the big deal was. I don't know why I was so feared. I don't know why I was so scared. They're just people. It's not like yeah. I won a war or something. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, that it really taught me that everything's going to be fine and just jump in and it'll be fine. And you know what, you're going to screw up and you learn from it. And, and, you know, the thing that I definitely do is the only way to improve is to screw up a lot yeah. and to make many mistakes. So you have to put yourself in the situation to be allowed to make the mistake. If you're always in a comfortable situation, you won't make a lot of mistakes. You're not going to learn. You're not going to grow. You're not going to get better. It needs to happen. You just need to, to, to mess up a lot. And in, you know, with my team, that's what I tell them all the time is I don't mind something where you mess it up. I mean, of course, if you're in accounting and you, you have to do a big restate, that's a problem. But, uh, you know. <laughs> Trying something new isn't the same as doing it wrong. But. That's right. You know, <laughs> calculated risk you should take. Yeah. But, but making mistakes is totally fine by me. I never care as long as you take ownership. Take ownership. I screwed it up. I wasn't thinking about it right or I didn't put enough time into it. I'm going to stay tonight and I'm going to fix it. Yeah. Once I hear that, I'm done. I'm like, good. Good job. I'm out. You know, I, but, I love this. Like you're nailing something. A lot of people are afraid to put themselves in those positions of, of fear, you know, and because they don't want to look dumb, they don't want to fail. But like the reality is if you, if they put themselves in the shoes of the person on the other side of the table, odds are that person's done something dumb in their career. They've, right. they've made a mistake and they're going to be a lot more forgiving than people actually realize mm -hmm. then, then they, they kind of don't, in, they don't understand that going in. So you should have confidence. And as long as you're confident that you can figure stuff out, Yep. That's the biggest thing. You can confident you can figure it out. You can probably take on new challenges. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, love it. totally. Yeah, so I, uh, so I did the sales rod, and then I started to get a little bit bored in that, in that position. Um, as I learned it, and I was traveling a lot, um, you know, I got promoted, and I took over some big $6 million territory. I was always away from home. You know, I was making good money for a young, you know, early 20s guy, you know, guy. I mean, more than all my friends were making. I had a company car. Back then, I had a cell phone. My there cell you phone go. was $1,000 a month because you have to pay for, if you're really young out there, you won't even know what this needs. You have to pay for roaming and long distance charges. So per minute, my call could be, if I was out of area, it could be $1.25 a minute. And uh, and I would just use that like crazy. So people thought I was a drug dealer, you know, because back then not Cause you lot. actually had a cell phone yeah. right they might have pager or something but you know and i'm just mm -hmm. on the phone like whatever and so you know i i thought i was a you know big time guy um but i got really bored of the role and it was a it was a little lonely for me and it became it wasn't intellectually stimulating enough for me anymore so um so anyway i you know i was talking within my company they were you know um trying to develop me and and i said look i want to go do something else you know long term what can i do they said well how about product management i said "Ooh, product management sounds interesting i used to work with the product managers as a sales guy you know they have to manage the pnl they have to work with manufacturing plus the engineering group and sales and you know product marketing and advertising they kind of had to work with everything they're sort of the center so i thought that was um a good place to go and they said yeah, yeah. but you need an mba and I said, oh, uh, well, I, had, I didn't really, you know, I, I don't know, maybe. He said, well, we'll sponsor it, but, okay. uh, you know, you got to go do it. So, so I did that part-time at USC in their professionals program. It took, you know, it was about like a two and a half, three-year program because, you know, you're sort of doing it part-time at night uh, and weekends. And uh, right in the middle of it, I said, you know what, I want to be a product manager now. So I left the company and went to another company called Harris Corporation to become a product line manager. Uh, they took over my MBA. I still did that. Um, so kind of fast forwarding through all that. Um, I said to myself, you know what, I don't want to be a product manager. <laughs> uh, what I loved about the job were the kind of the general manager part of the job, the leadership part of it. You sort of are only you own every area, but none of it reports to you as a product line manager. And hmm. so, 
Um, so there's that part. What I didn't like about it was the product, the PRD, the product requirements documents that I had to build. It's very detailed. It's um, really in the weeds and uh, uh, sort of, it wasn't me. And uh, I, I didn't like that aspect of the job. So I, I, I thought, hmm, maybe I want to do something else. So I graduated from my, um, from B-School at the worst time you could. So I was going to go off and be a consultant, work for a big Accenture or something like that and, and go learn other industries and uh, be an analyst and business analyst and sort of grow my, you know, kind of find myself again, uh, so to speak. But um, I graduated the worst time, uh, 2000, December 2001. Two, two major things happened in 2001. Yep. It was the dot-com bus and 9-11. There was not a single consulting company out there that was hiring. In fact, they were laying off in droves. Yeah. So um, there was this interesting sleepy little telco called AT&T uh, that <laughs> was recruited on my campus. And literally back then, this was before wireless was big and they're, they're now almost a media company. So it was before all that. They were just a telephone company. Yeah. Wireless too, but, but it wasn't just gigantic yet. Uh, there was no uh, iPhone yet. N none of that. So... Um, so anyhow, I, I just thought, huh, that's interesting. They have a leadership program. They're going to put me in some rotations and then kind of put you on a track. I thought that might be cool to kind of get a little bit of a variety of different kind of functions in a company and join a big, you know, blue chip business. Um, so, you know, I, so I joined at and I was going to spend three years there. I ended up there 10 years, um, seven jobs in 10 years. Wow. Uh, lots of, you know, I went from. My first job there was managing 18 field unionized technicians in San Francisco downtown. Uh, I'm a field manager in the field. I'm wearing boots. I have a truck. I'm climbing poles. Um, I'm worried about safety. I'm yeah. in the bowels of a building that can be super dirty and a lot of nasty stuff in there that you got to go through to, to get to the phone box. Wading through asbestos to get to the, oh, gosh, to the phone box. Oh, sometimes you're just, woo. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had to train on that, like to wear suits when you go crawl a space because there's bugs, there's flesh eating bugs, there's, uh, you know, there's asbestos, there's all kind of nastiness down there in a crawl space. So, uh, right, well, this is a first on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the most gratifying job I've ever had out of all things, it told nice. me, wow, um, I want to be a leader of some sort. Uh, I had 18 technicians and I took this uh, technician crew. They called us uh, uh, LDPers, Leadership Development Program folks. It's sort of a little bit like how the military works between enlisted and officer um, ranks. And so they saw me as a person that's just gonna come in for a year, let's, let's grind this guy out, let him learn his stuff and he's gonna go off to the office. You know. Just, he's going to leave. Yeah. So they gave me a, a crew that was number 24th in the district. And there were only 24 crews in the district. <laughs> in four months, I took them to number one. And we held the number one or two spot at, all the way through my, the rest of my 10 months. You know, I all right. How, how'd, you, how'd you do it? You know, again, back to the same thing. Like, what's in it for them? Yeah. They're unionized. They have to so do the a minimum amount of work. Otherwise, I can't fire them. If they follow the rules and do the minimum work, literally, I cannot fire them. So how do I get them to produce more? One of the biggest metrics in that ranking is, was something called good jobs in eight. It means how many jobs can you get done in eight, in, in equivalent eight hours, and, and any rework that comes back in 10 days is a minus to that number. Hmm. So, okay. uh, so there's a productivity metric. And um, so you know, how do I motivate the folks to get them there? I mean, number one is being there for them, being accountable to them. Just like I asked them to be accountable to me and the company and the and our clients and our customers, I'm asking, I'm saying myself to be accountable to them. I'd help them on jobs when they're in trouble. They said, they, they used to tell me this, a field manager in my last 10 years has never come out to the job to help me on it. Wow. And I said, but I'm a field manager. And they said, yeah. oh, but you field managers just stay back at the garage. You guys don't actually come out here. You know, why would you want to be out here in the elements with us? I said, but I'm a field manager, so of course I should be out here. So me being out there present, you know, even the troublemakers, you know, I remember telling one of my techs who was a troublemaker and not doing very well. I said, look, your best way, because he said, you're following me, you're harassing me, and all you're doing, you're always, you know, coming out to the field and coming to my jobs. I said, because you're not performing. So if you perform better, guess what? I'm going to leave you alone, and you're going to get all this free, free reign and free time and trust. 
But until then, I will be here all the time. I'm a field manager. I have the full right. You can call the union if you want. I'm here every day. I'm going to mess with you every day. I'm going to track your jobs. I'm going to follow you then. Um, so make this easier on yourself and me because I don't rather rather not be out here. I'd rather be at the garage is what I used to say. <laughs> and, uh, I need you to step it up and I need you to stop um, causing these client complaints. So, you know, we're, we're working a lot on some of his, his attitudes. <laughs> Got it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had a bad attitude. Um, and so, you know, I spent a lot of time and as we got to know each other, you know, we start to like each other. Initially, he hated me, you know, with all passion on management and I'm bothering him all the time. But we start to gain a good understanding with each other. So for me, it's always being transparent with people. I'm very straight with everyone. When I'm not happy with what you're doing, I tell you straight out. There's no talking around it. And when I'm happy with it, I celebrate it. So it's a little bit of highs and lows and yeah. uh, car- carrot and stick. But I'm transparent on both ends. Um, and again, putting myself in their shoes, what's in it for them? You know, how, how can I get to sort of uh, one of my mentors used to say to me, you have to win hearts and minds. That is the key to no matter what position you're in, that's all you need to do to get a high performing team. You actually don't even need to know or be an expert on their job. You need to win their hearts and minds yeah. by training, give them the right tools and they will, they will, a team will, will perform uh, for you. So I've definitely held that a lot. Um, so, you know, at at and the great opportunity they gave me there was bouncing me around from operations in, in big leadership roles to finance. And so I was in this field manager job, then I was a sales analyst, and then I thought I was going to get promoted to go be an area manager in, in operations, you know, like a second level manager. I was all excited about that. And I get a call from uh, my um, mentor VP, actually. And he said to me, uh, hey, Darren, I think it's time for your promotion. You know, uh, and I said, great. You know, so, so what, what territory am I getting? And he said, no, 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 no. Uh, you're going to be my, my, uh, my finance guy. And I went, what, what, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. You're going to be a kind of a <clears throat> lead, you know, FP&A analyst. You manage the whole $500 million budget. You're pre- basically my CFO. And, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're part of kind of the, the kind of leadership team for this, this kind of this business unit. It's about a 5,000 technician, you know, field operations group. Okay. Uh, and he was my mentor, but also saying, and you get exposure to me and you get to work with me directly. Um, and I think it's good for you. And I said to him, you know, yeah, Rick, uh, I, you know, I've never been a financial analyst before, and that's not an MBA school. They don't teach you how to be a financial analyst. They actually teach you how to be a CEO. Actually, that's what they teach you how to be. <laughs> kind of. uh, that's why everyone wants to start a company, you know, when you come out of B school. Yep. Uh, and, and I said, so I don't think I can even do it. And he just literally looked at me and said, ah, he sort of was like, you have an economics degree. You have, you have a B school background, like whatever, you'll get it. And I said to him, uh, okay. And then he looked at me and he just said, and also Darian, you never turned down a promotion. And I just went, all righty. Well, yeah. don't forget I was in a big company. So, you know, uh, you kind of sometimes need to drink the Kool-Aid when you're in a big company. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and something people don't understand, I think, is there, there are way less promotions that, uh, available at big companies, right? Despite, right? It's just harder to move up through the ranks. And so you don't, you don't yeah, pass up on that more one. Too, you know, stepping back from it is, you know, what he also meant by that is he put his neck on the line for me to say, I want this guy, you know, I'm um, mentoring that I wanted to be my finance head. Um, and, you know, that if I said no to that, and it was a promotion on top of it, he would look back. Hmm, interesting. That's okay. the interesting aspect is that people put their neck out on the line for you. And if you respect them, you know, and they're giving you a step up opportunity, you should, for the most part, take a risk and just give it a try. It's a free country. You don't have to do it forever. You don't even have to stay in a company. Yeah. You know, you don't like it. It's not for you anymore. Look for a new job and leave. Mm-hmm. You know, don't complain and sit there. Just, just go. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And you know, the days of, you know, being in a company for 30, 40 years and retiring, those are, they've really gone away. So the company's not going to help you with that. So you need to always be watching out for yourself. And if you're not happy in a place, it, it means it's time to leave. If you mm-hmm. can't get your head out of the funk, you shouldn't be there because you're not going to give them your best. If your head's not in the game, you just won't give them the, you, you know, your best. Yeah. Uh, so I, I bounced. Uh, so, so that was interesting. So I went into this fp and analyst role where I'm leading kind of the, you know, the, the, the finances and budgets for, for this group. 
Um, then I got uh, moved back out to the field and I had a 150 person kind of field operations team for the whole peninsula of Northern California. Um, and then um, I got promoted to a general manager for a, uh, was about 630 folk uh, team, 24 seven network operations team. Uh, that was, you know, like I was thinking I'm on my way in operations and it was, it was, a, it was a great role. Um, and then I got another call, and uh, this was an interesting one, from the CFO for the Western region, and her name's Lori, and she said, hey, Darren, I want to have lunch with you. And I said, oh, sure. I mean, okay. You know, I'm a general manager within a piece of the bigger budget she's managing as the CFO for the West region, so I figured, well, hey, the big boss says I need to be there. I told my VP, he's like, he laughs, he literally laughs, and he's like, yeah, yeah, cool. You might be leaving me soon. But anyway, go have a good lunch. And I just said, what are you talking about? I said, do you know something? And he goes, just, just go have the lunch. <laughs> go have this lunch. And she goes, yeah, Darian, um, I'm looking to replace um, one of the executive directors of FP&A for a $6 billion business sales business unit. Wow. Officer running that group is the hardest client we have. She is tough. This exec director that's in the role is getting demoted. Uh, she's a longtime vet, and and the officer is done with her. Just can't handle. It. Just can't. The, the, not happy with her. And uh, I'd like to get. I'd like to promote you and put you in the role. And I I looked at her. And I said, uh, Wow, thank you so much. But um, why me? I was an FP&A analyst in your group years ago, and now you want to put me as the executive director. There's multiple levels of. So there's the lead financial analyst, then there's a director, and then there's an exec. No, there's a, uh, I'm sorry, a senior manager, then a director, and then an executive director. So I said, okay. like, shouldn't I go through the steps? You know, it's, it's a little, I don't know if I can do it again, is, is when, remember what I said. And she did the same thing. Oh, uh, you know, you got a MBA, you'll figure it out. You'll have a good team and you'll figure it out. And I just went, okay. And, and I remember asking her, I said, why me though? And she said, because of your operational background. And you have enough chops to understand finance. And I just yeah. said to her, what do you mean by the operational background? She said, this group needs leadership. The reason why they're not performing is there's 13 individuals in this team. They're all over the place. They're working at like almost like an ad hoc project team. Like every little thing that comes down from upstairs, so to speak, is given to whoever the best is or who has the time. And she's like, we need to more operationalize this team to get cadence in the team. They're always behind on their MDNA for variance analysis every month. They miss their forecast dates all the time. They produce horrible forecasts on top wow. of it. They're not connected to their team, you know, the, the operating group. So I said, we think you can do it. And the officer in the group is really tough. And since you're an operations guy, you know how to handle tough situations. There's 24 yeah. seven operations, a fiber gets cut. Like I am woken up at night on a Saturday. I could have been drinking that night and had a great time trying to sleep. And I, I'm going to get a call and I better answer it because, Man. you know, half of, a city could be no data, you know, or, or something like that. So yeah. I'd be in, involved. So, so anyway, I, I, uh, I took the leap. I, I, I took the great advice of many mentors again, which is like, yeah, yeah, Darian never turned on a promotion. So I just did <laughs> it. Uh, the first three months in that job, I'm telling you, Mike, my head hurt. Like the concepts, the managing this gigantic p and I mean, a bunch of VPs yelling at me about something. I'm supporting the officer, mind you. Yeah. Our VPs are begging me for something or complaining about something, you know, because they're all jockeying for money. And um, first three months were really tough. I thought to myself, I made the wrong decision. I'm going to fail. And my career is done here at at and mm. um, But, you know, again, I took the attitude back to what I said earlier, which is, you know, it, it's going to be fine. I have faith in myself. It just means I'm going to have to work a little harder in the meantime. Uh, I'm going to have to be more resourceful. I'm going to have to study up on things a little bit more. I think I pulled out my corporate finance book. I don't know how many times, you know, okay. no more do we do that? We can just go online. But back then yeah. I had to whip on my book and I'm like, you know, just like, why didn't I pay attention more during the class on this? <laughs> I, didn't th I didn't think I'd be using it in my career. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I remember calling some old colleagues in my MBA class, you know, they were all finance guys. And I said, what is, you know, help me through this. So um, I did have a good team. And, the, and so what I did was create these lanes within the team. And I made everyone um, OBTKs is, is what another mentor used to say, one butt to kick. 
Like who is the one but the kick for this area? They live and die by this. They might not even be the one that's doing all the work. Yeah. They might be leading the project. But who's the one that goes to sleep every night stressed? You cannot have ownership across multiple people. It never works. It needs to be one person. Yeah. So always whenever I'm working a project, even if it's cross-functional, I'm always like, wait, wait, so who, who's, the, who's, the, who's the person I'm going to talk to every time on this project? I'm not talking to five people. No, that's person. so important. Who is it? And you yeah. need to know it all. I mean, at least generally, you need to know it all. You want to bring the expert in on one portion, bring that person in. But you better know generally what it is. Um, so I took that attitude within the team, built that team, and we got this team that got into a cadence flow. And I almost, you know, then I was able to pull away from it and start to do more higher level thinking and work more with the officer. And then I, you know, within six months, I became her trusted, like, advisor. Like, she... It's really interesting. She would put me into things, maybe because of some of the other background I had in my work experience. She would put me into things that weren't even finance. Like for instance, she had a head of marketing. Marketing would do, she'd do a pitch on something and she'd look at me in the meeting and she'd go, Darian, what do you think? I said, well, this, that, this, and you know, this is my opinion. She goes, okay, Darian, I want you to work with Marianne, who was the head of marketing. I want you to work with Marianne and Marianne, I want you to get Darian okay with it and then I'll sign off. Wow. And I'm like, uh, well, I got stuff to do. <laughs> By the way, I have a day job. You set up an AT and T, even though you support a business unit or even a company, you still your direct reporting line is still through a corporate finance route all the way to corporate. They do this so that the CEO of a business unit or a, a separate, you know, a, a subsidiary company can't direct things in a certain way, mm. so that we always stay compliant. Right? It's a big public company. So yeah, we make things compliant. We follow all the rules. So. Um, so I had to do things for my reporting line. Yet, you know, Robin, you know, the officers putting me in, kind of in charge to make decisions on marketing stuff, you know. So, um, so I started to gain a lot of power in the group and I became literally the person that when no one wanted to bring it to her, she, they just bring it to me. If I was good, then I'd get it done with her. I'd, okay. go, I'd go, hey, Robin, I, want, I think it's a good idea we should do it. She's like, she would say things like this to me when she was really busy. She's like, Darian, I'm traveling all week. I don't have time to talk to you about this. And she goes, it's just one of those things I should just trust you and say yes. And I would say to her, yes. And she'd go, done. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, like that's, that's the level you need to get to with your boss. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And again, I wasn't the finance expert. I don't need to be because mm -hmm. my job was to translate some complex materials into layman's terms that someone like the officer can use to make decisions. Of course, I need to know finance. I mean, I can't be this complete, you know, Mason here. I, I need to understand it, but I don't have to be the person that understands every little single detail. Of course, meeting, you know, prior to pitching something or meeting with someone, I, I dive in deep so that I can answer most questions on the fly. I don't want to be in a position where I say, well, let me bring in my person. I want to be, be able to answer the most minute details for instance, our monthly results deck, when I present to the board, I want to know, I want to be able to even ex explain why uh, 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 travel and entertainment is overrunning budget and for what reason and who did the traveling. Like, I literally want to know that detail, even That's, though our PL is huge, yeah. mainly because it creates a lot of trust. Is it hard ROI? Not really, but it's about, I want the board to trust me when I say something and not second guess me. And when I can answer deep, any question that they ask, and you know, boards, there's like the big stuff that they should ask, but they somehow want to ask sometimes some weird little thing that actually it goes like this matter. down the yeah, rabbit it hole. It doesn't matter. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, it's five thousand dollars we overspend. Like, who cares? I got a hundred million dollar PL, like leave me alone, right? Yeah. But but um uh and I don't know if it's they're testing you or something just stuck out to them, or it's just them talking, right? They got the big stuff right? The big picture stuff. If you build good dashboards and, and bench, you know, good, good metrics, then they understand that already. Yeah. Now there's a sort of like picking at little things. And as a CFO in a big multi-tiered organization, if I can answer that level of detail, then they're like, ah, oh, this, this person's on it. Yeah. He's got it. Got they it actually ask less questions, which is I've, more interesting too. That's yeah. That's a interesting thing. That's very, very true. I've, I've seen that play out at Flowcast as well with our board. Yeah. The, the more I know, the fewer questions I get at any, any given point. Right. And then they gain trust for you. Yeah. And, and really they want what, what um, I read this from the former CFO of Microsoft. Uh, his last name was Liddell. And he talked, I read an article and really hit home to me. I read it. It's a long time ago, you know, 15 years ago, maybe. 
and he wrote a, a kind of a blog article about from data to information to insights. Hmm. And so he, 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 he believed that was his number one job at Microsoft. There's data, a bunch of numbers, all kind of numbers. You know, I mean, of course, there's accounting stuff, there's operational data, just numbers everywhere, and there's a lot of data. But how do you turn the data into information, which is the reporting part? So how do you put together the report so that it uses the, 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 uh, the real estate properly and gives the right insights? Like my, my P&Ls always, uh, always show in a summary form, they always show three months of actuals. They show the budget, they show the variance to budget, they show year over year growth. I never put percent to budget. I think it's a meaningless column. Sorry if you use it, Mike. I, no, I, I don't use it. I mm -hmm. use year over year and then I have a year to date piece. So you can you can literally from one page literally see the trends without a graph. Because awesome. if year over year yeah. growth is higher in one month than the year to date, that means your growth is increased. Again, it's just a quick bite. Of course you gotta dig deeper, but just on a quick glance you can get it. And then the three month actuals, where I got that from was I started to realize that every time I used to show the P&L and results in you know, a one month and the year to date, which is kind of traditional view, um, what does someone always ask? How did we do last month though? Right, they always ask that. Like if, if, if we're doing bad in an area or good in an area, they're like, yeah, yeah, but is that better than last month? Yeah. So I was like, I'm just gonna put it there. Now the history that's, is all there, but on a, on a summary view kind of pops out a little bit. Yeah. So, that's that's a great, great advice for working with the board. It's kind of you, you iterate based on the common questions you get, right? right? We've, we've done something similar. We kind of morph the board meeting based on what I know they're going to ask now that I've had 20 board meetings with these people. That's right. you know? Yeah. Yep. And, um, and so, you know, also I, I like to get out of producing more reports just because, because let's say the board asks questions. This, sometimes what I've seen when I've taken over a group, is the reporting pack is really big because, but there's a lot of repetition. What it means is the board asked something and then they created another report to answer that, that line of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, what I realized is actually the whole uh, uh, um, reporting package needs to be revamped. Don't add stuff where it repeats each other. Each new page needs to tell you something different. It can't be uh, each new page is half of what the old page showed you, but just a little bit more because yeah. it's <laughs> So don't restart a report, rebuild a report, so to speak, and make it become like a, a, a double axis, you know, sort of a thing. Like, let me answer two questions in the best way I can with the real estate I have in the page. You know, sometimes it's not possible, by the way. So, um, but, but anyhow, um, so, uh, so, so that was a, you know, big, you know, big part of getting it to information. And then he's like, and then the next level is now that I can produce the right dashboards, insight, now you understand what's going on. Now I need to provide insights. So what are the insights piece? And so in my communication with the board or, or with anybody I present to, I'm trying to get it to, so they trust me to just literally give them the insights. I don't want them asking about the data and where it came from. I want them looking at the information, the report, and then I want to give them insights that they can trust. And that makes for actually a more efficient uh, um, meeting. And also I want to get away from them betting me more to how do we help solve this problem together? Yeah, and get them there. Let, let's let's hurry up and get there. Don't don't start. You know, you, you've probably seen it. Maybe in even in your early days, if you're figuring out your reporting package, you know, you're confusing them. They're asking you a lot of questions on where the data is and how you what's the business rule. And it's like you want to get up as quickly away from that as possible, so you get to some more productive uh, conversations. Yeah, that's not. It's never productive going down that rabbit hole. Shifting, yeah. reshifting. That's really really key. Yeah. Well, AT and T sounds like it was a pretty awesome learning experience yeah, was, here. Yeah, the executive director of FPNA yeah. really kicked off my um, um, sort of finance career. I wanted to stay in finance because I, I was thinking of um, possibly moving on from AT and T at some point, and I needed something that's transferable to you know the outside world. Uh, my last role there, um, I got the opportunity to be CFO for AT and T Interactive. It's basically a separate business of at the time separate business of AT and T was the ad tech arm. Okay. Uh, yellowpages.com. And then of course we did a lot of, you know, third party stuff with Google and Yahoo to, to, to produce uh, advertising packages for our local, local clients. And it was all local search stuff. Um, so that was a, a interesting foray into the world of kind of VC, PE, investor back type employees. You know, at hmm. is like an old telco people been around a long time, but at Interactive was sort of a new separate business. 
you know, we hired people from Yahoo, you know, we were right in Glendale. So a lot of Yahoo, ex Yahoo folks you know, right. from the Burbank office back, back then. And, um, and that's when Yahoo started to, you know, kind of tilt a little bit. So it was a good time to, to steal people. Start poaching. Yep. Yeah. Start poaching from there. Um, so, uh, that, that gave me the itch to want to leave. And then I jumped to a company called Velocify in, uh, Los Angeles, a, a little $10 million SaaS company at the time and 45 employees and then, and did the leap. A uh, little scary, you know, Nick Hedges was CEO and his um, theory was let's go raise a series B and let's go, you know, grow this faster. And we raised the, you know, 15 and a quarter together, you know, in about four months time. And then we put the money to work. Um, it was a little stark to go from such a big company, in my big companies in my whole career to then this company is 45 people. So I the CEO asked me to go buy sodas at Costco to fill the refrigerator. I just went, Oh boy, what just happened? I mean, I used to have an executive assistant. <laughs> I had a, like a consolidation senior manager that did all the work for me. I didn't yeah. even text Mike. I just <laughs> I would print them out and I like mark them up, change this. And I check them off and I go to my meeting, you know, yeah. then I'm like sitting there building models with Nick to, to raise funding. And I'm like, Oh man, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, it's not as glamorous as I thought it was. I thought this VC back thing was going to be, you know, like what I, I thought it was just, you know, super, you know, but anyway. Early um, on, it is not. Yeah, it is not glamorous <laughs> yeah. at all. So, uh, but, but then I mean, at, the, you know, at the same time, you get to do things like work with the CEO to build out the model and go on the road and, and right. pitch with VCs and, and raise right. money, which is, can you tell me how, um, you know, I, I've historically done all of our fundraising. We don't have a CFO. I've just done everything. Oh, right. So, so I'm curious how you loop this, like how as a CFO, were you involved in it? Were you running the pitches? Were you the numbers guy? Like, just tell me more about that. Yeah, no, we, I mean, we just, you know, it was a tag team with, with Nick and I, and, and, you know, he was more still in the dream and the bigger pitch. I'm going over all the numbers, the trends. Um, I answered, you know, generally, you know, he knew a lot of answers at times too. He had been in the company a long time, but uh, he would, you know, step back and allow me to answer the questions that were more, um, you know, related to the numbers and not just the financials, but, you know, so the operating metrics, you know, bookings churn, you know, ARPU, you know, what have you, um, right. how it helps though. And how it'll help you, Mike, in the future is even though, you know, the answers too, um, it helps you think. So in the meeting, there's going to be these investors peppering you, right. Bombing you with questions and it, you're doing everything. You're trying to be, super optimistic and sell the dream and the vision of the market and all that. Yet you're also trying to answer some detailed question on the numbers. Splitting it allows you to think and you need to, you can be in the optimistic kind of dream mode and in your passion. And then the CFO can sit there, your VP of finance can sit there and be the person that has the spreadsheet up of all the historicals, you know, it's on their computer and any question they'd like, boom, 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 they can answer that. Oh, hold on. Let me look at that real quick. Oh yeah. That's what that is. You know? Yeah. And then you can continue to pitch. Okay. Now the next thing, because you need to think about the next thing I'm going to talk about is the TAM and why it's so reachable. And, you know, uh, but if you're doing it all, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. It's, to, to it's it tough. And that sounds very nice. What you just described, that sounds much more well, relaxing. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, so then there, um, I, I got, uh, recruited to come here to WebPT, uh, moved my whole family to Phoenix for this opportunity. And, uh, you know, we had a, um, you know, it was, it was a larger scale business at the time than, than Velocify when I started there. It was about 200 employees when I started here. Uh, we've grown, uh, quite a bit, not all organically. We've done some M&A as well. And, um, you know, we're now about 520 employees. Okay. And, um, you know, we just had a great uh, exit outcome with Warburg and, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, I'm, I'm staying and, you know, Warburg wants me to, and we're going to keep, you know, going to the next stage here. And it's pretty exciting. Never grew a kind of a company from a hundred to, you know, 500, so to speak. So it's going to be an interesting, um, you know, I've been part of really big things, but I, it was already there. It was already big. Right. I yeah. tried the little thing, you know, growth stage, get it to, you know, a, a little something. Uh, but now this is sort of, you know, kind of this next stage is going to be, a, you know, fun to, to, to go do that. And the job changes, you know, part of what the CFO role is really does change as the company gets bigger. You know, what are you when it's small, it's get the audits right, make sure you're following all the right accounting rules, get all the operational pieces in, in place, have a cadence, you know, close. So you have this predictable close. Um, produce good forecasts. You know, you're more modeling things. You're raising money, um, and you're deep in it as a CFO. You know, sometimes I'm calling customers for money. 
Uh, but no longer yeah. am I doing that, you know, much bigger team now, it's like 20 large. And so uh, now it's like stepping up a notch and like mentoring um, and being more part of the rest of the organization, the rest of the company. Yeah. Uh, you know, part of, you know, probably your question later, it, it's really the CFO role changes to become um, moving away from scorekeeping that bandwidth on scorekeeping and shifting more of it to growth and other strategic initiatives. Hmm. And that, that, that's that shift that um, the new CFOs nowadays need to do. You know, it's not like 20 years ago when the CFO, you know, of course, C CPA, accounting, compliance, you know, now they want the CF CFOs, especially in growth stage and technology companies. It's all about have a strong controllership, but I want you, the CFO, to work on growth initiatives, maybe even some business development and other strategic initiatives. And how do I have you sit in every other department's, you know, as a, as a partner, because maybe they're not as financially adept or they're also not in the unique position that I am where I can see literally all parts of the business. So I can actually connect the dots. Yeah. This, you know, head of whatever is doing something and it's great for his department. But is it great for her department? Is it great for the company? And only I'm the one or the CEO can be the one that goes, ah, that's, that's not, that's conflicting with something else we're doing over here. And the CEO, as you get bigger too, needs to spend more time out of the office and doing all the BD pitching investors um, and, and full growth stuff. You know, at some point we'll go international, she'll have to disappear for some weeks to do that. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, I can get more into the bowels of the business and help run it. You know, when she's gone, you know, I'm running the business. So she's gone this week. I'm running the senior management team meetings. Um, I'm making the, all the decisions for her. And that's kind of the tag team effect. And that's, you know, a bit what they're looking for in the new CEO, CFOs, that they can do that. Yeah. You know, the, um, the CEOs are, COOs are almost fading, starting to fade away. And a lot of those responsibilities are being assumed by the CFO. That's what I've kind of noticed is morphing. Yeah. And that's one of the themes is that that evolving role is more, really more of like, I was going to say a co-CEO almost, but COO is probably a much more accurate description of what the CFO is becoming. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, the story we, when we were prepping for this, we chatted about a little bit, but the, the story I find fascinating is one of your, uh, your controller at WebPT, you know, wanted to become a CFO and you actually helped make that happen. So that, that is like, perfect for this podcast. So I'd love to just hear that story for, uh, for as we wrap it up here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot has to do with him. Uh, you know, he's a risk taker. He, he's willing to work hard. He's willing to learn a uh, voracious learner and, and real open to coaching. You know, he's not easily, um, he's not easily offended and not that I'm saying I'm a mean guy, but you know, to really help someone sometimes, you know, some of the feedback is going to be pretty rough. Yeah, and, for uh, sure. And it's going to hurt a little bit, but you can't have hurt feelings. The one good thing that he had, and I'm not this, but he was an athlete in college. And you know what athletes go through is they just constantly get beaten. Like they just get like, you know, something like, oh, my leg's hurting. Uh, too bad. Keep it going. Or <laughs> you're not running as fast today as you did yesterday. You suck. You know, yep. move it. And, and so, and I'm not an athlete, by the way. So, um, but um, um, I think that that helped a lot in, in kind of his, his mental state on being able to handle this. So his background was uh, CPA, uh, yep. accounting, CPA, um, you know, audit. He became all the way, he didn't, we never got to audit manager, but audit senior. Then he joined big company and he was in accounting, you know, senior manager, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, and he was in the co he did a cost co cost accounting too at a large organization. Um, so then he joined WebPT as controller. You know the company was small then, and so he was a controller when I came in. Uh, his the former CFO had hired him, and so he was he was here. He was an incumbent, and uh, I was meeting with him, and you know, and I just asked him, "What do you want to do?" Uh, and he said, you know, I'd like to actually get away from being a controller. I want to be a CFO and I can see that I need to be better at FP&A. All right. I don't think I can get there. And I said, okay. Um, so, you know, it was a little bit assessing if he had the chops. Yeah. So the one thing that, that in this day and age of recurring revenue business is the current P&L that you see does not actually tell you the health of the business. I know that sounds crazy for me to say. I definitely look at the at PL like all the time. I'm looking at this stuff, <laughs> but and I'm writing up all this stuff to the board. But um, the more important metrics are the forward-looking metrics. And in you know recurring revenue businesses, every 
di different business might have different metrics, but you know, it's booking. So it's sales, it's upsells, it's um, cross sells, it's churn, it's, you know, customer size, you know, it's the, the sales funnel, um, you know, leads that, and what's your close rate and all, all those things. So those are more than it's all non gap, which, kill, non -gap. which kills me as the accountant. Yeah. It's all non gap. And by the way, the worst part of the systems that track all that is they're not accounting systems. So guess what? They don't go through a monthly close. Nope. nope. You change something in Salesforce, the whole thing restates. Yep. That's that, crazy to a finance guy. It's like, what do you it, mean? What do you, it just automatically restates? Yes. <laughs> it's a it perpetual it, system. It, it kills me. We, we have to download a copy every day to yes, close that's what Salesforce. We do, we do okay. the golden report. <laughs> yeah. You you download know. the monster, <laughs> just huge flat file and just dump it in a data storage. <laughs> and, that's, and we use that thing like crazy. <laughs> All right. Well. Yeah. So that's the funny thing about uh, uh, that. But, you know, what that really is telling you is that um, the traditional, um, you know, if you come up through the accounting ranks, it's, you know, hard to get your mind around that everything you learned and been trained on is not what counts anymore. You, you know, I definitely need to understand the accounting. I explain it. I have to, we have to, you know, get the audit and all those things. And with ASC 606, it's changed. I mean, shoot, we got more EBIT all of a sudden. I mean, it's not even real. It's like, how, what do you mean? I, how did I get more profitable? It's, it's the same. It's the same thing, you know? Don't, so, don't get me uh, started. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, you know, like amortize everything out, everything, you know, it's like, oh gosh. So, oh my gosh. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, most VCs and P's actually don't care about that. They're kind they, of trying to get, almost get you back to kind of cash accounting. Like, like, what are you really spending? Like cash flow is really important to them. And like, oh gosh, you, you capitalize your R&D, oh, darn, right? Like if, mm -hmm. all, if at all possible, if you can get away from it, um, which, you know, it's not easy sometimes, you know, but um, try not to. <laughs> because unfortunately, you're going to add it back when, when you, when, if you are capitalizing your R&D, what the invest VC does is they literally pull it back and uh, uh, because it's real people, it's not yeah. capitalized what, it's actually a, a developer sitting there that's, just burning wages every, every, every month. So, yeah, um, so anyhow, I, you know, getting away from understanding that the forward look, and that's the hard part for, for some folks. So with Ross, uh, his name's Ross. So with Ross, what I did is took him under my wing. I said, look, if you want to learn and you want to work hard, I'm down to give you all my time because I'm an FP&A guy. I'm not a CPA accountant guy. Yeah. Um, that was my finance training at least. And of course I have sales and all that, but, but then the finance side of things, it's not accounting. So I said, I think we'd be a good combination. I'm actually going to learn some stuff from you uh, on the accounting side. Like, you know, for instance, purchase price allocation of an acquisition. Oh, gosh, you know, the yeah. first one made my head hurt. The second one was much easier. <laughs> I start to, oh, okay, that's how you handle goodwill. No, and I can actually, it's somewhat subjective. And I can actually, if I pitch it right, it, it's like before we do the purchase price allocation, I ask the investor, what are you trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. They're like, no, just do it. No, no, no. There's ways that I can present it that actually make it go different ways because it's not a set formula. Yeah. <laughs> like goodwill, you know, like what is it? So, um, so anyhow. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, I love goodwill. Customer, I, how much are clients worth? Like, I wish, I mean, I wish I was, you know, a crystal ball, right? Like, uh, who knows? So, yeah. so anyhow, um, uh, so, so, you know, you know, we, we, um, he, he was down for the challenge. And so I started to insert him and said, okay, fine. We need to build fp &A function and I'll be involved a lot in the beginning. So I showed him how I like to build packages. He was a voracious learner. I started to find out he's actually great at modeling. And so I said, there's a lot to do. You know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot, lot of good things here that he can learn. I taught him a very simple concept, which is what I, I called rule of 78. You take, a bunch of ones, just draw it on a spreadsheet, 12 ones on the top, 11, 10, you know, do that. That tells you what, if you sold a dollar in bookings a month, how many, how much revenue you're going to have in the rolling year. Hmm. And so why that, con it's like the waterfall. Yeah. And why that concept's important for an accountant to learn first is that, you know, it's not, you sell a dollar a year and it's $12. You sell it, if you have no churn, you sell a dollar a month, you're gonna have $78 of revenue. Now let's layer and churn into that and let's see how this really destroys that revenue stream. Yeah. It destroys it fast. Churn so, is a killer, yeah. 
it, so then it's like, oh, I got it. And then we build the rule of 140, 144, which is, you know, if you do the whole 12 and you keep uh, water falling all out, I have to draw it out one day. Um, and I always draw it on a whiteboard when I first tell people, then that's 144. So if you sold a dollar a month and you had no churn over a two year period, it's 144 uh, uh, of revenue. So showing that concept was the first step. I also made him read um, before I even started Bessemer's uh, 10 rules of cloud or something like that. I love, I, I love that report. anymore. I have yeah. it it's from 2010. Yeah. It's like getting, getting sassy or something. And it yeah, has something. the, the five benchmarks. That's like, what they, well, that was what he, uh, my CFO at Cornerstone. First thing he handed me when I walked in the building, he's like, oh, really? oh, memorize this. Yep. <laughs> That's great. Totally. Yeah, it kind of gives you the concept even on the technology and what cloud is as well. It's not just the metrics, but mainly the metrics, you well, know, the, like the value and why it turns important. So it was a great brief. He read it a couple times. He really embodied it. And then, and then I told him, just go to as many online things that you can, because there's a lot out there. SaaS was really starting to pick up uh, then. And of course, there's a ton of stuff now. So uh, much. Out there. And there's all kind of new metrics. There's like the old magic number, and now there's the new magic number. And it's like, which magic, you know, so investors like, Darian, I want the magic number on your metric sheet. I'm like, what kind of magic number? You want your V1, one? you want V2, you want the final like, final. Which, which one do you one? want, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I want the one where it's not depressed by the gross margin. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll give you that. I mean, whatever. <laughs> yeah, you want the worst looking one or the better looking one? Right, I'm, not, right. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, so it's really funny to, to go through all that. But, um, uh, you know, really it was uh, working deeply with him. He definitely had the, the, the chops for it because I could see that he could model. And again, it was um, feeding with a lot of educational tools. I'd let him go to a lot of conferences. Uh, to stay excited about it. And then I started to, we started to hire up on the accounting side so he can start to divorce himself from it more. Okay. And a little more time to FB&A. Um, and really it was just me working with him quite a bit. I had him even join me in a lot of meetings to see how I talk through things. Because again, you didn't want to just go into fb &A, you want to be a CFO. So he would join me uh, doing a negotiation with Salesforce on the meeting. Oh, and cool. Watch how I did it. Because I can be a real hard negotiator. I know I come off nice, but when it comes to, saving the company money. I'm super cheap. I'm very, very cheap. And I'm just literally trying to grind, <laughs> grind <laughs> vendors out, just, just grind them. And, and I play a lot of, you know, the, the things that like things that, you know, for instance, I might've won a Salesforce for the company too, but I play the good cop, bad cop. Like, yeah, the sales team wants Salesforce, but I could care less. Yeah. That's super cheap. Uh, we're using that. So up to you, man, I need a better price. Like, I don't care. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll just go dark on them. And they'll freak out and give me two more quotes. And all of a sudden the price comes out like 30% over time. You just go to it. And then finally I go, yeah, okay, it's a good price. And then we sign. Um, so, you know, he kind of well watched played there. Yeah. He kind of watches uh, uh, some of that. And then I would uh, start to push down some authority to him. Uh, you know, he's now going off to successfully going off to be a, a, a CFO for, you know, a little startup here in Phoenix. They're going to raise a, a series B as well. So super awesome opportunity for him. Um, but, you know, leading up to that, I would move like, let's say all the headcount and compensation approvals to him. So I started just pushing down more responsibility to him and asked him to just use me more as a mentor. Uh, it, of course, it helped me to release my bandwidth, but also um, teach him to, kind of be in the thick of things. Also, he wasn't scared to, you know, that's what I told him. I said, look, I'm going to push more responsibility to you, but understand the more I do this, the more chance you have of getting fired. Yeah. Make it very dramatic. Like, mm -hmm. you know, moving up, everyone wants to move up. And I don't know that you always understand what that means. Like the decisions I make as a CFO um, I, are, are, are steeped in ambiguity. There's a lot of risk in my decision and I totally could get fired. Mm -hmm. Like if I make the wrong decision, it's, it's trouble for me. Um, which, you know, are you built for that, that pressure and that comfort of making decisions and owning your decision in places where you literally don't have all the information? Like you have to make a decision. I mean, you as CEO, like, yeah. like you mess up a couple of things, people are getting, you're gonna, people are gonna lose their jobs, right? And you're going to lose your facility, your building, you know, because you can't pay, you know, you don't have the money to pay for the beautiful office you have. And yet you don't have all the information. Yeah. Yet you need to make the decision next week because, you know, you got to, you got to, the, the, the world is changing. You got to hurry up and make a decision. So 
are you comfortable to be in that position and also to know the risks of that? Yes, you make more money, but the reason why you do is because you're taking on so much more risk um, yeah. in, your, in your career, actually. And you screw up once as a CEO, as a CFO of a really nice company, then your next CFO role will probably be not in the best companies. Yeah, that's a and really so, like people talk. Really good point. Just, everyone's going to call Warburg and Battery, my old investors, and ask them how did Darian do. Right. <laughs> They're just going to ask them. They're not yeah. going to ask me if I can talk to your reference. They're going to call the partner, you know, at, at the investment firm. Yeah. yeah, that's. I think a lot of people don't realize that actually. As you move up in your career, uh, the idea of you uh, owning the reference to a potential employer is not how that works anymore. They're going to back channel with someone you worked a couple back channel ago everything. and totally. Yeah. So uh, just note for our audience, definitely don't burn bridges. It might not catch up with you this next job, but it, it, it will catch up with you at some point. Definitely don't burn bridges. You know, every yeah. time I left a role, whether they were happy, you know, they weren't always happy that I was leaving, but you know, I did my job to the very last day as if I'm going to be there. And yeah. that was really important to me. Um, more for my own moral compass, but also, um, you know, it helped me in the future because, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't like, oh, he's checked out for the last month. Like literally, I was to the last day I was in a meeting, I think one of the senior officers said, Darren, what are you doing here? I'm like, I still work for at and yeah. He's like, yeah, but you're, you're leaving. It's your last day. I said, it's okay. And, you know, I need to prove this last thing and that's my last business case I'm approving. And, uh, and I'm out of here. So, and now, and, and now the reference call with them is, yeah, Darian just worked until the last hour at at and It was unbelievable. That's so, mm -hmm. yeah, that's so great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, that was awesome. The, the story about, you know, you helping coach your, your controller into the CFO role is like so spot on. So on that note, I want to do a little bit of a pitch for you. If you yeah. live in the Phoenix area and you're interested in moving up through the ranks, Darian might be an awesome guy to, to work for and work with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Help and make your career there. Um, I know recruiting can be difficult, but like people want to work with great, great leaders and you seem like one of those people. Um, so yeah, kudos, kudos to you on that. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with me today. I, re I really appreciate it. And I think it was super helpful for the audience and they'll get value out of it as well. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Awesome. Right, thanks, Darian. Yeah, All you right. have a great rest of your day. All right, thanks. Take care.